Well, hello, wisdom seekers. Turn to someone else and say that. Hello, wisdom seekers. <laughs> that's right. Let's identify who we are because as people of great faith, that's what we're all about. We're here to engage in the learning experience of life. Seeking wisdom for today's text says the number one thing, the most important, the most supreme, the first principle, and then the words is saying and emphasizing above all else, be a seeker of wisdom, making sure that not only are you getting information, but that you get understanding. Key elements in our life is that we have a powerful understanding of all the infinite wisdom that's available to us in the journey of our living. For wisdom is not just gathering all this great information, but how we might apply it in our lives. For wisdom is not just this body of info, but it is the moral quality of knowing what you don't know. It's really important. Great wisdom should unfold for us an insight into what we don't know, as well as helping us to figure out how to handle some of the crucial things within life some of the crucial elements of the experience we call this life journey that we're going through. There are three things that we really face and we have great challenges with in our life. And the first one is that we face ignorance. We just don't know. We just don't understand. We face that a lot. A lot of people who are in a world are saying, you know what, I wish I knew more. I wish I comprehended more. I wish I was more informed or enlightened. Second thing is our uncertainty. We face a lot of uncertainty within our world, and we're always questioning and wondering where we fit, uncertainty even around our faith or uncertainty around what we believe. So we find that in each one of these cases, we are seekers of wisdom. And lastly, another crucial area where we are looking for insight is that of we face feelings of limitation. So we struggle with the ignorance, the uncertainty, and a sense of limitation in the world around us. How beautiful it is to know that the unfolding of great wisdom is there to help us in each one of these situations or scenarios or things that we may face in life. It's great to know that wisdom is there to help us remove all ignorance, to understand, to comprehend. Great wisdom is there to help us to be certain, to not be wavering in our faith and wondering which way to go or what where to turn next, but to have an element of certainty to say, this I know, that I know, that I know, and this is what I believe. To help you with great wisdom unfolding the truth to say, I am, have a great assurance, I have a great strength and a confidence in the things that I believe in. And how beautiful is that wisdom unfolds for us the understanding that in this world of the divine, there is no lack. For God's great generosity is always there unfolding for us. So as we're seekers of wisdom, we're finding the great strength. We're finding the tools that say, you know what? I no longer have to walk in ignorance. There is a pathway that I can learn and understand. And I no longer have to be uncertain. And I no longer have to live with any kind of sense of lack at all. For God is ever unfolding insight for us in great truth. That's the exciting news as we're entering the world of a learning experience. You came into this time, to this element, to this world, to this moment. You're here for a learning experience. That's right, just as you started kindergarten, and you worked up through college, maybe post-college, whatever it may be, you continue on in education. Each, that experience of going through step-by-step -step learning stages is the journey of our life. That's right, every day we're in the school of learning. We're in the school of experience. We're in the school of unfolding greater insight and wisdom. For the Spirit is ever teaching and the question we ask is, what did the Spirit teach you today? The Spirit is ever speaking. What did the Spirit of God, the Spirit of this universe around us, what did it say to you? What has it unfolded for you? Because this is the journey of our learning and as wisdom seekers. Because when we come to that place, we find that we are people who then can address these issues that we may struggle with. So we also find that wisdom brings balance. How important it is that we have balance in our life. How many of you feel like sometimes you're off balance? Uh-huh. We find those times where you maybe have a little spiritual vertigo, too, where you may feel like, whoa, I'm a little spiritually dizzy. I'm a little woozy. I don't really know where I stand or how to stand or what kind of firm foundation I can be on. 
You see, wisdom offers us this great balance uh, of yin and yang, of understanding of truth, of what is that itch that unfolds for us that helps us uh, be so practical in the journey of our life. Now, we here who embrace this positive spiritual a spirituality that's so practical will often encourage you with great phrases and words like, you're fabulous, you're fierce, you can do this, you're amazing. We want to encourage all that spirit of affirmation. We believe in the power of yes, don't we? And we affirm one another and we constantly look to each other and say, you're great. You're really, I see the goodness of God in you and I see something special unfolding for you. Sometimes at risk in these kind of very positive environments, we find people taking on almost a spiritual arrogance, an attitude that says, you know what? You're right. I am fabulous. You're right. I'm really great. Maybe you didn't know that, but let me tell you, I'm really great. You know what? Everybody else has been telling me I'm great, and I believe I'm great too, and that's wonderful, but sometimes it gets out of balance, and it then becomes our spiritual arrogance. I'm far more enlightened than you are comes the attitude, and we start looking around to say, you know, well, I'm so sorry for you because you don't quite know uh, all the great truths that I know, and I'm far more enlightened, and I'm far more uh, blessed and insightful than others may be. So we walk around sometimes being so spiritually minded we're no earthly good because our whole attitude is that we think in ways that, well, I'm just better. I'm living my best life, and sorry you're not. Uh, that kind of arrogance that may come out in the world around us. So there's a balance, a balance that wisdom brings that says as we also look and affirm the good, yes, we don't want to diminish that. We also bring in line the fact that we may see that it's important to have a wider perspective than just looking at ourselves, but a wider perspective of seeing how uh, what are our strengths and our weaknesses? What are the connections and what are dependencies? And what role do we play in the larger story? Is it all about me and my fabulousness? Is my spiritual life all just about me and walking in my blessing? Or is there something more than that? Helping us to look at all the scenarios in a broader way that bring balance to the spiritual life where we see, yes, the affirmation, but yes. Maybe we need to pause and address that there are weaknesses, shortcomings that we have. For even though each and every one of us has amazing talents, and we have some amazing talents in this church, creativity, wonderful skills and blessings. Norma bakes cakes. She's very creative there. Musical people here singing and playing the piano and instruments, how wonderful that is. We see people bringing creativity. Martha creating all the wonderful Mother's Day gifts for us. Oh, wonderful talents all around us. We see that constantly. But we also have to acknowledge to bring balance. Maybe we also have shortcomings and that we need to look at those. What they may be, because if we're constantly falling into our temptations, into our shortcomings and repeating them over again, and we don't work to overcome those weaknesses, we'll not experience the fullness that wisdom brings to us. We're not going to get there to the fullness if we don't look at those things that may be tripping us up time and time again. And we constantly say, wait a minute, I need to pause for wisdom is not always knowing all the love and light, but it's wisdom always, it's unfolding for us also the places where love and light is missing in our journey, pointing those out as well. So the beginning of a worthwhile living is a confrontation or a conversation that you may have with yourself where you begin to look and say, wait a minute, what are the things I need to work on that I may live out this balanced life of, yes, the positive, yes, I'm fabulous, yes, I know that, and yes, here's some places I can improve and I can work upon in my life. You see, the Bible offers us this very illustration for us. It's seen in the beautiful story of Jesus' life. Now, we look to the ancients unfolding through the book of Mark and Luke, unfolding to the story of Jesus beginning his ministry. It begins with his wonderful baptism experience. And in that experience, Jesus experiences those wonderful moments of the heavens opening up and a voice saying, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You 
Well, you can imagine any of us beginning to hear these wonderful compliments might think, yeah, that's right. I am the beloved. You know what? And God is pleased in me. Wonderful to hear that. Hey, did you know God's pleased with me? God's pleased with me. You know, and we may walk around with that kind of feeling. And then there's a need for some balance. Because what does the Bible story say? Instantly, instantly, I mean, the story shifts to say, Jesus found himself in the wilderness. In the wilderness to be tempted. In the wilderness to have a conversation, a real confrontation with that which is within. That might speak to what are the weaknesses. Yes, you're beloved. Yes, God is pleased with you. But are there things that we all need to work on is being illustrated for the story of Jesus is your story. It's my story. It's our story. We find ourselves in the story to say, wait a minute, maybe there's things that we need to work on for. In that wilderness time, he was tempted in all different ways. Now, we see the story very metaphorically for Satan. We think of tempting him. It is that which the adversarial thought that goes on in our own mind. And trust me, we have had adversarial thoughts in our own lives that want to pop up, that kind of work against our highest and best. They want to tempt us to say, you know, maybe you should think this way. Maybe you should think that you're better than someone else. Maybe you should think or believe or act in some way uh, that you should uh, reflect your higher understanding of spiritual knowledge. Maybe you should brag a bit more about yourself. Maybe you should be a little bit more confident in the sense that uh, speaking about how wonderful you are and you see this temptation for we are all in the wilderness of our life. And there it is that he is confronted with his uncertainty. He's, uncom he's confronted with ignorance and lack, just the same. For you see, Jesus was confronted with the adversarial thoughts of temptation to say, Satan saying, you know what? If you just worship me, there could be great things happening. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. And Jesus says, I know the truth. I know the truth that there's one God, one power, and I need not divide between two. I know there's one. So I'm going to put aside that adversarial thought for wisdom's unfolding. And I awaken the ancient scriptures, and there he's reflecting on a scripture that says, I know this to be true. I know this to be true. So I dismiss that and release that adversarial thought. The idea of lack and Satan says to him, well, what about, you know, you're hungry now and you don't have. What if you just turn the stone into bread? Oh, how wonderful this would be. And Jesus says, ah, but we don't live by bread alone, but the word of God. In other words, there's no limitation in my world. I need not manifest through magic. I need not buy into your ways of saying that there's not enough to go around. For I know that there is. You see, Jesus' wilderness experience was a wonderful time of unfolding the very highest and best within his life and a time for him to deal with what might be temptations for him. The same dealing with what might be temptations for us, what might be our shortcomings and how important it is that we take time to maybe look at them and address them. Because I want to say welcome to life. Life is your wilderness journey. In the Bible, do we not see the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness? Jesus in the wilderness? John the Baptist coming from the wilderness? Moses in the wilderness of the desert, trying to find his own place in the world and his unfolding of his ministry. For the wilderness is this symbolism of a time of great seeking and searching that we do in our life. Some of you may feel like right now you're in the wilderness. You're in your own wilderness. Because you too are trying to seek and search. You are a seeker of wisdom. And it's not a bad place to be. But in that place, we must ask the important questions and have that conversation to say, what do I need to accomplish while I'm here in the wilderness? What do I need to do? What do I need to work on? What areas do I need to do that I might come out of this wilderness experience and move into my promised land? What areas do I need to do that where I really need to embrace the spirit of God's wisdom that would bring me to the balanced life that I'm told to live? How many of you have seen the TV show Naked and Afraid? You know, it's uh, a TV show that's out there on cable. Maybe some of you have seen it where there are two people who have been selected to go into the wilderness naked and many times afraid. Describes our journey where we're called to be naked of all of the trappings that we may put on in our lives, then we say, oh, but you don't know 
I have a spirituality here. Uh, I'm going to clothe myself in and look at who I And it becomes coverings where we're not really being honest, truthful with who we really are. So we strip ourselves naked, shall we say, releasing all the. The difference is we don't have to be afraid. We're out in the wilderness, though we may be uh, naked before God in all ways and releasing all kinds of facades or barriers or things that we may have dressed ourselves in. But we don't have to be afraid, for we know that God is there as the great teacher willing to unfold insight and wisdom. So if you ask the right questions, if you're in the wilderness experience, you're going to find that God is there saying, I'm there with you, unfolding insight, helping you. As you engage in this conversation, for truly humble people are working to magnify the best in themselves and to remove and to release and let go of the worst. They're learning to become strong in weak places. This is what seekers of wisdom do. Learn to become strong in weak places. First, we have to know what are the weak places? What are they? Jesus, in this wilderness temptation, discovers weak places, places that say fame may tempt you, power may tempt you, this may tempt you. And he became this great overcomer of all of those kind of things that may be there in adversarial thinking from our highest best. And he became strong in each one of those places. It begins with great knowledge that we all have this inclination then to fall short of our glory. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. In the Pentecostal church, boy, oh boy, did we learn about sin. You know, sin had to have extra S's, you know, because it was really bad. You know, if you heard the word, you couldn't just say sin. It was sin. You are a sinner. You know, it was like, oh, my Lord, it was emphasizing over and over again how bad you were. Because when you heard the word sin, it was like the worst, the most horrible thing. And with that, you had to take on this load of guilt, shame. You know, and self-hatred because you are a sinner and you are so bad and you are so evil and so, you know, boy, oh boy, it was really something to hear people preach all about sin. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, what happens is that suddenly then we become, oh, well, I don't want to talk about my sin. What is sin? Let's just talk about it. The Greek word, the real word means missing the mark, falling short. And what happens is we've created a world that says, I don't want to talk about my falling short. I don't want to talk about the times when I missed the mark. Because then you won't think, I'm pretty fabulous. You won't think about how great I am. You won't think about all these issues. You won't think this facade I got to put out that I'm really a fabulous Christian. You know, you won't believe that anymore if I talk about my sin uh, or my shortfalls or my shortcomings. Or the places where I simply missed the mark. You know, growing up as a child, my mother and father were pastors, so I thought for sure they were sinless. I thought, how do you get to the, be at the point where you're completely sinless, you know? Because they were say, proclaiming they're going to heaven and they're saved and all this was great, but are you sinless? Were there moments when my mother and father failed, fell short, maybe didn't quite hit the mark? Yes, there were. Were they sinless? And I thought, well, wait a minute. You know, they're always constantly preaching this gospel message that says, you know, we're going to go to hell if we sin. And if there's any moment that we sin, we might be destined to hell. But I better be quickly trying to, constantly asking God, forgive me, forgive me. So I watch every five minutes and do a salvation prayer really quick. He asked for some kind of forgiveness because I was afraid I might be caught in sin, you know, because I didn't know that I could be sinless or what that would mean for me in my life. You see, here's what I want to get across to you. Is this very truth that we all have fallen short? Everyone in this room. So no one needs to point a finger in Christianity or pass judgment on anyone else. So isn't that beautiful to know, hey, no finger pointing here, no judgment here. This is a judgment-free zone. Isn't that wonderful to know that you've come to a place like that? Because that's what Christianity was meant to be. No judgment whatsoever. So it doesn't matter what you did last night or it doesn't matter where you are or the failures or shortcomings you had because we are not here to focus on yours. Your job is to focus on your shortcomings and my job is to focus on my 
shortcomings. My job is not to focus on your shortcomings. So as a pastor, you come to visit with me and people say, oh, I'm afraid to tell the pastor my sins or my shortcomings or my failures. I'm going to say, there's no judgment. For I have no good to accomplish in judging you. But there's simply just love, support, encouragement for you to make the choices, for you to understand, for you to understand that there is work for you to do, not work for me to do in you or for you, but for all of us to do the same. And for whatever you may be trying or explaining or trying to express that may be your shortcoming, I have them too. I am not perfect. In this realm of God, when we understand that we all have some work to do. Isn't that wonderful? We're not here on this earth to do nothing. we got some assignments to do, right? We have a purpose in life. So when we realize we all have shortcomings and we all have some places where we've missed the mark, we've all have tried and maybe failed in some way, we understand that that's okay. That's all right. Because most important, what we're learning is that we are learning something through the experience and we're gaining the wisdom to improve, to be the greater light, to be the greater love that we intended to be. And when we've fallen short, there is no guilt, there is no shame imparted, but there is loving support. How many of you have seen a little baby turn to learn to walk? And the, when you've been in that room, you've seen the mother and father watching that child walk. And when that child falls down and trips, that mother and father say, shame on you. Shame on you, you little kid. How dare you not walk perfectly? You're my son. You're my daughter. You should be getting up and walking just perfectly. And it's a shameful thing. You, I'm so embarrassed. I'm humiliated by you because you don't know how to walk from out of, coming out of the womb. <laughs> how crazy that is. We know that's not true. But parents say, you fell. And what do they do? They pick you right up. And in the process of helping that child learn to walk, they may hold the fingers. They may guide. They may bounce that little baby along. Come on, come on, you can do it. Yeah, maybe there'll be all kinds of encouragement. Daddy will hold on to the baby, and Mama will say, Come to Mama, come to Mama, come on. That's what the church is called to do. That's what we're called to do. When one another slips and falls or has a failure, when someone misses the mark of their highest and best, we as a body of believers of great faith should be saying, it's all right. Come on. Let me hold your hand. Let me grab you and help you walk. Get pick up and walk again. Let me help you. And if there should be people across the room say, come on, come on, get up and walk again. You can do it. I know you can because I believe in you. You see, that's the whole message that we understand that what we are here to do is develop, grow, and in wisdom, build character. So in the journey of building our character, we express this humility that says, number one, we all have faults. We all have some places to work on. And that's okay, because that's our journey here. We're in the school of life, and it's okay to know that we have something to work on. Secondly, it's beautiful to know that there is a body of believers. There's a body of like-minded people to support us and encourage us. And thirdly, to know the wisdom of God is ever saying to you, you know what? I'm there to help you through this all and to unfold lessons of life that are there to help you experience your highest and best. So the real question is, are you ready to go down to go up? You know, are you ready to go down to go up? Because this is our whole spiritual life of understanding that sometimes we have to descend through the valley of humility to rise up to the heights of great character. We have to descend to the lower levels of saying, wait a minute, what do I need to work on in my life so that I can ascend, rise to the highest levels of great character in my world and in my life, in my experience? You know, I've been at the Grand Canyon. And you look across that beautiful rift, that valley down below, that distance that is so far down and deep, and over to the vista on the other side. And one day we were there and the guide said, wouldn't you love to go to the other side? I said, oh, I'd love to see what's on the other side. Are you ready to ride the donkey down into the canyon, down the valley to get up to go up the other side? But whoa, that's a lot of work to get to the other side. Oh, but it's worth it. 
Are you ready to go down to go up? Are you ready to go down in a sense of humility and humbleness to say, I realize I got some things to do, but I know that as I go down in humility, I will rise again in great character development because each of us has a journey on this earth. Here's a suggestion. Can I offer this to you? At the end of every day, you spend a little time and catalog the errors or the places where you felt possibly you made a mistake. Places where you might say, you know, I could do better. And then begin to develop some strategies and say, God, I know the infinite wisdom that is of this universe is mine. I welcome it. Help me to understand the pathway as I humble myself and go down to reach greater heights. Help me and let me catalog this. Let me journal this. Let me write out strategies to say, you know, I could have been more patient at work. You know, I could have been more loving in a conversation with family and friends. You know what? I could have been more generous to that homeless person or person in need. Maybe there's something that you could have done better, but as we catalog and work through this with a strategy that says, I am moving higher and higher. I have this great intention, and I know that God will make a way when even there seems like no way for me to accomplish my highest and best. Because this is where people realize character is built in our life. Good character. It's not automatic. Really, it's not automatic. You have to build the character stone by stone, laying down the foundation. So as a wisdom seeker, what you're seeking for is I want to develop the character within me. We sang that beautiful phrase in the song, name above all names, meaning character above all character. For your name symbolizes your character. For when you say a certain name, you instantly reflect upon that character, the essence of that person. If I say Hitler, you all think, wonderful, let's celebrate. No, you don't, do you? You're Suddenly you're thinking, ooh, Hitler, character, name association with a type of character. I say Mother Teresa. Ah, oh, character, compassionate. You see, the name reflects the character. So name above all names means character above all character. And that's the journey of our life. We're building the character to be that one who is a true follower of the teachings of Jesus. And how do we do this? But one of the beautiful things that character is built in our lives as we simply become still and we quiet ourselves. How important it is that character building starts with quieting ourselves. Hush. Hush the conversation. Hush all the mind chatter. All, hush all the things that are going on in your life. Be quiet and still, for in that quieting, what happens is it opens up a space for grace. That's right. It opens up a space for God's grace to come into our lives and fill that void within us. It's so important that we understand that to allow the science uh, silence of our minds then to allow a releasing work, a letting go of those things that have held us back, those habits and ways and thoughts that have been adversarial to our highest and best, that have been keeping us from hitting the target time after time and missing the mark. It creates a space when we are silenced that needs to be filled, and what will rush in is this wonderful transformational power of God. You know, my mother reflect upon her today. It's my first Mother's Day without her. She passed away last fall. I reflect upon all kinds of great memories, and my sister and I had phone conversations this week talking about the wonderful ways that our mother shaped our lives. And I remember my mother teaching me how to ride a bike. As a little kid, I can remember how many times I tried to get on that bike, and I tripped, I tipped it over. I failed, I skinned my knee. She constantly put me back on the bike and said over and over again, you can do this, you can do it. Even though I missed the mark, even though I struggled with it, she picked me up constantly. Why? Because she believed I can do this. And I want to tell you this, that the Spirit of God, the wisdom of God is saying the same thing to you. As you acknowledge your shortcomings, and we all have them, 
The Spirit of God is saying, get back on the bike, ride again. The Spirit of God is saying, this is the wisdom. You can do it. I believe in you. The Spirit of God is ever unfolding the pathways for you to understand how to and how to improve upon and how to be the best that you can. What happens is this wonderful power of the divine presence, the good within you says you can do it. You can do it. So I invite you today to move along the journey of building character, to allow wisdom to shape your life and have a conversation with yourself that says, wait a minute, I know my highest and best. I know I'm a beloved child of God and God is pleased. But there are things I still need to work on. And that's what I'm here to do. So let's get to work. Let's get to work on that journey of seeking the wisdom, building the character, having the humility that says, I'm willing to go down and humble myself that I might rise up, that I might strengthen within me uh, that power and presence that will help me overcome ignorance, uncertainty, and any sense of lack. So I say to you, hello, wisdom seeker. That's right. We're on a wonderful journey. Hello, person who is building character. Hello to one another who is there to affirm and strengthen the other in this process. Hello to the body of Christ. Amen.